welcome everybody if you're joining us for the first time. This is a Bohan webinar. We have so many incredible panelists today um, who are going to be sharing what it means to be a Bohemian here today. Um, and that's, that's the culture that we want to develop here. My name's Tash Thomas. Uh, I am a diversity and inclusion specialist and a speaker, panelist, everything else. You can find me on LinkedIn. But I will introduce our wonderful collection of panelists that we have today. So first up, we have Mary Shannon, um, is a senior lecturer in the School of Humanities, uh, University of Roehampton. Also written a book, uh, Dickens Reynolds, uh, her first book, Dickin, Dickens Reynolds and Mayhew on Wellington Street, uh, the print culture of a Victorian street. And it's looking at, you know, what it means to be a bohemian and the, and the history behind it. Um, also involved in research for her second book, but she'll be telling you lots more about that later. So I don't want to steal from her. Next up, we have Colin Charles, who is the creative director, executive uh, creative director, managing director and board director, founder of Cooperative African Futurist Arts, has made more than 100 TV different, different TV ads, as well as winning over 40 awards for those TV ads. So um, a very, very important person here today. We also have Michael Gray, uh, has had a career in the music industry, commencing um, with recording classical music at EMI, based at Abbey Road Studios. We all know that very, very famous uh, studio as well as being, uh, Michael was elected a member of the Savage Club and subsequently joining the committee. He's now the honorary archivist of the club and has recently collaborated with fellow member Alan Williams in a compilation of club diner menus, dating from the 1898 to 2019, uh, entitled It's Simply Savage. And then joining us back, Michael Gross, who I think was having connection issues, it's okay. Uh, spoken word artist, performance poet, um, and filmmaker and historian. So we have an eclectic panel for you here today. Um, lots of different experience from all different elements of, uh, of Bohemia life. And we're actually gonna start with Mary today and your sort of definition of what it means to be a Bohemian um, and more. So I'll, I'll hand over you and I will put myself on mute right now. Thanks, Tash. Um, and thanks uh, to, to Boham for inviting me to join this panel. Um, and thank you to to my fellow, fellow panellists for joining in um, and, and to everyone else for being here. Uh, it's, uh, it's an honour to kick off this panel um, and to be in such esteemed company, so thank you very much. Um, as Tash said, I work at the University of Roehampton and my research is on 19th century literature and culture. And uh, one of the things I have done quite a bit of work on is bohemianism. Um, my current project is about a man called Billy Waters, who was a busker in London in the 19th century. So in the, um, around about 1810, 1820s. Uh, and Billy Waters um, was somebody who was, who was forced to, by circumstance to live outside the normal structures uh, of his day. Um, he was born in New York, uh, he was African-American. He somehow joined the British Navy. Um, I'm trying to work out how that happened. I think he volunteered. Uh, he was invalided out when he lost a leg. Um, and because his naval pension was so, so poor, so, so um, paltry, he uh, became a busker to, to um, increase his income. And he, uh, his pitch was outside the Adelphi Theatre uh, on the Strand. So if you know where, um, if you know where Trafalgar Square is, and you walk east back towards St Paul's along the Strand, that was where Billy Waters used to perform um, for the London crowds. Uh, so, so when when um, I was asked to be on this panel, I was thinking, well, was Billy Waters a Bohemian? Um, and I was thinking, well, he danced. Uh, he played the fiddle. That was his. That was his act. Um, he was uh, because he 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 associated with um, the street poor of London. Uh, he was designated the king of the beggars um, in popular literature. He became a really famous character in London um, and indeed a popular character in a hit literary craze. Uh, there was a, a, a book that he featured in that was wildly popular, and then he got turned into a character in a in play um, that, that was popular in London's theatre land, but also in New York, it went transatlantic. 
Um, but uh, when I was trying to think, well, was Billy Waters a bohemian? I was asking myself, what is a bohemian? Or perhaps more precisely, can you be a bohemian before the word in its, in its modern sense uh, was, was really invented? Um, because Billy Waters is, was alive in the 1820s, but it wasn't until the 1840s that we get this word bohemian in the way we think about it today. Uh, and it comes originally from Paris. Um, a man called Henry Merger was down on his luck. He was in his 20s. Uh, he was scrabbling and living together, writing bits and bobs for various different journals in Paris. Um, and he wrote some stories in the 1840s called Scenes of Bohemian Life. And they were all about him and his friends, basically, uh, living in Paris, in poverty, um, drinking too much in the cafes, uh, spending more money on booze than food, trying to make it big in the newspaper world, um, living slightly on the edge of what was, you know, within the spirit of the law or not, uh, but with a great belief in kind of art and self-expression and um, the power of doing things differently. Uh, so Henry Merger wrote these stories about his life and his friends. Um, and he then turned them into a play which was put on in Paris. And it was an immense hit. It was an instant craze. We're talking kind of, you know, people cramming every night to try and see this play. Um, and you might have heard of the opera La Boheme. That's an adaptation of, of this play. Um, so in the 1840s, that's when we get this idea of the bohemian as, as somebody young, somebody uh, dynamic, somebody kind of living on the edge of, of what is respectable, um, but somebody with a real belief in, in, in the kind of in, in art and literature and, and, um, and a free freedom about their, their way of life. Um, before 1830, a bohemian is a gypsy, uh, to use a Victorian term. What we somebody we would now call a traveller, uh, but the Victorians would say a gypsy, uh, or perhaps somebody from um, actual Bohemia itself. Bohemia is a place; it's in what is now Czechoslovakia. Um, so it's only really with uh, with with the turn to modernity, with um, with the increased industrialization, with the changes of the modern world, that that the idea of a Bohemian. As, as somebody who lives outside that regimented, modern, industrialized world becomes so necessary and so attractive. Um, and in, in the 19th century, the Bohemian is very much set against uh, the idea of, um, or the figure of the bourgeois, right? So the, the, the sort of, um, this, your stereotypical middle-class person who is, doing an office job or, or um, perhaps a, you know, a managerial job in a factory uh, who, is, who is paying their taxes, going to work nine to five um, and, and behaving at all times. And the bohemian and the bourgeois in the 19th century are set up as kind of two characters who, who are very, very different. Um, but sometimes people in the 19th century said, well, actually these two characters are two sides of the same coin. You know, sometimes you get people who are actually really quite well off, who would pretend to be bohemian for, for a bit, or who would play at being bohemian, um, or who would, who would uh, drop out of their original lifestyle and, and experience bohemian life, um, want to experience it for themselves. So let's go back then to Billy Waters. Um, by this, if we take this 19th century definition of the bohemian, uh, somebody young, somebody um, living outside the sort of uh, uh, accepted um, structures of, of modern industrial, industrialized life, uh, somebody who perhaps sees those structures as um, antithetical to, to freedom and creative expression, uh, somebody who wants to make a name for themselves through that art, um, Somebody who dices on the line of what is, you know, what is, what is um, law and order and what is not. Uh, could we think of Billy Waters, I wondered, the king of the beggars, as a bohemian? Um, well, as I said at the beginning, Billy Waters, uh, he was, he died before the term was invented in its 
in its modern sense. But, but maybe um, through his, the way he uh, attempted to turn poverty into, into performance art um, against all the odds, I think it's fair to say that, that we can certainly call Billy Waters a bohemian. Um, that's it from me for now. Thank you so much, Mary. Um, it's so fascinating. And I mean, when I think of the word bohemian, I obviously think of Bohemian Rhapsody <laughs> as this kind of a standard um, sort of connection, as well as you think of it being used in the film Moulin Rouge, right? It really came to sort of pop culture then. Um, but how interesting the idea that Billy Walters, living all these years ago, now has somebody delving into his life and into his history. I just think, you know, he's been walking around London for many, many years, sort of not really being considered. And now all these years later, his life, his journey, you know, and everything he stood for is being brought to the forefront in 2021. Um, I just think it's so fascinating. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, for anybody who's watching, I'd like to say that we do have questions open. So please feel free to put questions to our panelists as you've heard them speak. I'm sure you've got lots for Mary. <laughs> I do. Um, but we will move on for now to our next one. I'm just going to go in order of who is kind of clear picture on my screen. Uh, so Michael Gray um, will be our next speaker today. Um, I'm going to hand over to you, Michael. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for uh, inviting me on the panel today. Um, I'm going to talk uh, for a short, very short while about the origins of the Savage Club. Um, now, the founding meeting of the club took place on the 12th of October, 1857, in a room on the first floor of the Crown Tavern, which is Vinegar Yard, over against the gallery entrance of Drury Lane Theatre. Now, this meeting occurred after a letter sent out by a temp the temporary honorary secretary, George Augustus Sala. And he sent this letter out to what he considered to be prospective members. And the letter advised that it would be a meeting of gentlemen connected with literature and the fine arts, and warmly interested in the promotion of Christian knowledge, and the sale of excisable liquors, which is quite an important part of the setup, with a view to forming a social society or club. Nobody actually knows how many letters were sent out, and the number attending this first meeting was really quite small. Now, many of the original members who signed up were drawn from the ranks of bohemian journalists and writers, particularly those for the Illustrated London News, which was a very well-known, famous uh, um, uh, printed material for the time. And that included George Augustus Sala himself. He, in fact, was, was a great writer for the Illustrated London News. And they considered themselves unlikely to be accepted into the older arts-related Garrick Club. They thought this, this, this really wouldn't work out, they wouldn't be accepted as members. They felt the need of a place of reunion in their hours of leisure. They might gather together and enjoy each other's society, apart from the publicity of that which was known in Johnson, that, that's not Boris, of course, um, uh, Johnson's time as the coffee house, and equally apart from the chilling splendor of the modern club. Now, this is the, the, they they were entrepreneurs in the sense they wanted something rather different from themselves to what already existed the the the, the coffee houses and the modern club. They also, which I think is an interesting point, they believed that bohemianism is a temperament rather than a particular form of, of behavior. It, it's a temperament that leads you to, 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 to mix and to meet with those of a similar intention as yourself. Regarding the naming of the club, 
there have been various versions put forward by some of the original members as to the christening of the Savage Club and said to have been carried out at the time in a frolicsome humour, which I think is a, is a delightful phrase. Suggestions included the Addison, the Johnson, the Goldsmith, and the Shakespeare. It finally, this discussion finally led to a member calling out the Savage, which was then adopted. There was talk that the name related to a literary friend of Samuel Johnson, a vagabond, dissipated, down at heel poet who had died in a debtor's, debtor's prison in Bristol in 1743. One member being quoted as saying, if we accept Richard Savage as our godfather, it shows there is no pride in us. Um, I think he means that, that we're not going to be in any way proud and pompous about uh, any club or society that, 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 uh, that we, we um, hear, hear with in uh, form. It's an interesting to note that there was a member, John Defret Francis, who travelled the world quite widely, and he presented a choice of tomahawks, boomerangs and assegais for display in the club. Um, they are uh, one or two items still still remain within the within the uh, within the uh, the uh, items of owned by the club. Uh, I think, as I mentioned before, members were entrepreneurial in in seeking this 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 new form of gathering, and they sought companionship and the hospitality of good fellowship and were known to each other by the soubriquet Brother Savage and showed a keenness for entertainment. Now, this is something that, that su survives well, well uh, into today, that after a, each dinner, there is always uh, entertainment, um, usually given by members of the Savage Club, uh, musicians, uh, writers, and so forth, who, who give a very, a very varied uh, performances uh, after each dinner. Um, magicians, conjurers, the, the, these are here as well, um, and and there's a group of of, uh, of uh, jazz musicians, particularly, um, who who play regularly. A a phrase that came into being uh, as the as the Savage Club was formed was the pursuit of happiness, and now that is as relevant, I think, to the feeling of the club now as it was then after it was formed. Um, these early Bohemians provided these these uh, early members provided content line after line and page after page of material for sale in a growing market in cheap entertainment for the masses. They were working men in literature and the arts and authored an enormous amount of ephemeral literature, non-fiction, poetry and illustration. Within two decades, the Savage Club had become almost respectable. The early requirement, a working man in literature or art and a good fellow, was soon broadened to include mu musicians with actors and scientists added in 1870. And members of the legal profession joined quite a bit later. That was in 1956, particularly retired judges, retired barristers uh, are, now, um, are now members of the of the club. So I think uh, to sum up, we can say that the pursuit of happiness by way of the Savage Club continues well with us. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Michael. I think, I mean, I have to say, I think the name Savage Club is a brilliant name. And I thought it was really interesting, the idea of 
bohemian being a temperament rather than a behavior you so often think of it you know it's in the things that you do and the interests that you have but actually to think that you have a bohemian temperament i i like that that's that's a can you put that on a cv you know that in, on my linkedin <laughs> that i have a bohemian temperament i think that's <laughs> something yes to yeah. add. it's a really interesting um thought to really delve into that actually and and look at the the temperament of a bohemian um, thank you so, so much. I'm sure we'll have some questions at the end coming your way. Um, for now, I'm going to hand over to Colin. Before I start, I'm going to, I'm going to give you my personal definition of a bohemian. A uh, bohemian is not a, a hedonist, pleasure seeker. Uh, a bohemian um, is interested in art and culture. And a bohemian is a fearless experience seeker open-minded and an anti-racist i'd say and i'm going to talk about my favorite uh south london bohemian he's not famous but he's a mate of mine his name is dick jewel and uh he lived two roads from me in east croydon and uh, he's a bit older than me he used to dj at um, the georgian club which was a reggae club at east croydon station uh where my mum used to go uh there came a time when i had to leave uh, Croydon and I went down to Brighton and there was Dick working, uh, well, he was going to Croydon Art School uh, doing a printmaking course. <clears throat> and he used to go around to parties with his little record box of singles. And I remember the coolest clothes shop in Brighton was called the Gog Shop. Um, and they gave him a couple of shirts and said, could you make some ads for us to put up in our shop? And uh, so he took these beautiful folded shirts, inked them up and put them in the printing press and did a series of pieces, framed them, took them and got paid. They got out of Brighton, went back to London a bit before I did, and he got a gig at Charisma Records and they gave him his own label and said, you can do what you like. And he went to Jamaica to find Gregory Isaacs and got two albums worth of tunes from Gregory um, and he put them out as two albums, More Gregory and uh, Lonely Lover. He used the pictures that he took of Gregory in Jamaica as the covers, he typeset the covers himself. Half the tunes were backed by Roots Radix and the other half by Sly and Robbie and classic uh, Dick Jewel, he put the Sly and Robbies on one side and the uh, Bruce Radix on the other side. Um, also around that time, he made a book, a little book called Found Photos, but thick. And um, he had been going around, the, you know the photo booths that you find in uh, railway stations? You used to find them a lot, railway stations, department stores, post offices. And he'd gone around and he picked up all the photos that you, <coughs> you might find behind the machine or torn up around the machine. And the book only had the photos in it. And in the preface, he said, I'm interested in these photos because they're images of people that they themselves have rejected. Um, um, I moved up to land London and uh, he started a series called, of films called Magic Movement, shooting on Super 8. Super 8 in those days was the cheapest medium to make a film on. You could buy a Super 8 camera in a second hand shop and a projector. Uh, one series he did, I remember, was called Jazz Room. It was shot upstairs at um, Electric Ballroom. DJ was uh, Paul Murphy, Murphy, and he played hard bebop, uh, sometimes Brazilian, sometimes a bit, bit of uh, soca. And these young guys were jazz dancers, really fast uh, foot movements, a million spins, and it was relentless, just filming, dancing, no, no story or anything like that. Around the same time, I'm working with Ken McDonald of uh, Sudbourne Road in Brixton. Uh, we're doing a Super 8 film club called Really, upstairs at Ronnie Scott's. And um, you had to stand up watching the films because it was a nightclub. And most Super 8 films are silent. So I brought my record box and I would pick a tune that I thought went with the film. And Dick used to come every week and show his film. Sometimes he'd bring his own tunes. Now this is, we're up to the 80s now, 
uh, hollowed out uh, Thatcher's Britain. Everywhere, all over London, there's uh, empty buildings. And all Bohemians were squatting at that time. And uh, Dick opened up the, the, the mum and dad of all squats around the corner from the Royal College of Art, just uh, up the road from the Science Museum. Whole row of houses, maybe a community of 200 Bohemians living in these fabulous houses, uh, uh, <clears throat> palatial kind of Belgravia buildings with uh, furniture from, from skips. And uh, of course, at the same time, there were empty warehouses and uh, the warehouse party uh, thing was blown up. And, um, and warehouses were kind of dirty and cold, leaky, and, and, and they needed to feel like a nightclub. And, um, and so I'm claiming to have invented uh, uh, visuals at warehouse parties. Yeah, I'm challenging anyone. And that entailed liberating a scaffolding from, from a nearby building site, constructing it inside the warehouse, and then setting up your projectors and your slide projectors around the scaffolding and, and provide everyone with a 360 uh, view of your films and your slides and we'd overlay them. It looked absolutely beautiful. And I'd invite Dick a lot because Dick had lots of films of people dancing and uh, uh, people drumming. Uh, we did um, uh, <coughs> Dance Wicked, Delirium. If any of you remember Delirium, Charing Cross, um, Zoo, Zoom, Rap Attack. Um, most of the major warehouse parties were doing them. Then Dick embarked on a project at Kinky Galinky. Kinky Galinky at the time was, um, by the time it got to Leicester Square, was uh, every last Saturday, I think, of the month, a thousand drag queens and, and cross-dressers and trans, transsexuals. Um, again, Dick, relentless filming, no narrative, just people being people. Um, and all the time, we're going every Sunday to the ICA uh, for the chess, chess night at the Institute of Contemporary Art. Moving up to the 90s, uh, South Africa's free. Suddenly I felt I've got to go there and warm my hands. And I'm not there more than a year. And Dick turns up at my flat in Yeovil, Dick Jewell, with a man called Robert Trance. And we have a lovely evening, uh, drinking and smoking and eating and... Um, I've got my record box, so I'm dropping tunes. And at the end of the evening, Robert Trance says, why don't you work with me? I'm promoting South African jazz in South Africa. And I said, yeah, yeah, do I get to work with Dick? And he said, yeah. And so Dick filmed most of the jazz legends around Johannesburg around that time. Moses Molalekwa, Mabi Tobajani, I'm main dropping here. Sipo um, um, and uh, the Orlando, uh, Orlando Pirates Supporters Club, which was Soweto's biggest football team. Um, after that, I moved to West Africa. I didn't see Dick much for a couple of decades, but today we're still mates. Um, if you look him up, I looked him up this morning. He's still making books. Uh, he's got a piece at the Science Museum. Don't know what it is. Is a piece about him in the Dazed and Confused. He's teaching at the Royal College of Art. And I would say Dick Jewell of South London is a great example of a bohemian life well lived. Thank you. Thank you so much, Colin. Wow. Just that's just do you know what actually the the thing that I take away from that is that Dick sounds like somebody, which I think actually is kind of the the center of being a bohemian is its passion, completely driven by passion, rather than being dictated by all of the, you know, the financials, the this and the that, and the, the politics and everything else. It's actually, what am I passionate about? What, what do I want to leave here? What do I want to do? Where is my heart taking me? And that's what seems to take him everywhere, all around, connecting with so many different people, but also so protected. And everything that he's doing right the fact that you say like now he's you know he's, he's got an exhibition in this museum he's teaching at this university which a lot of people will probably strive years and years and years to achieve following that very you know static and one-dimensional path and actually when you follow your passion and that's the thing that drives you 
you'll find that people will gravitate to that and want to elevate that without you really having to do as much as what you conventionally think, right? Um, I'm going to be looking him up. <laughs> He's become my new hero, I think, actually, and my new inspiration in life. Um, I always say in the old, the old saying of um, to be a jack of all trades, master of none, and you flip it round, jack of none, master of all. And that is, that is what Dick sounds like, exactly that. Thank you so much for sharing with us uh, today, Colin. And I'm going to hand over to our final panelist today. It's the other Michael. Um, come on up, Michael. Hello. Can I be heard? Yes, yes you can be. Uh, I'm telling you, I've, every, I've been sitting there listening to everybody's story. Because I had to do, when I was invited to this panel, uh, I, I, I was a bit lost because I saw these esteemed names at the, on, on the panel list. I said, like, what am I going to say? What am I going to do? But um, when I did the research and looked at Bohemia, Bohemia, man, what does it mean? I saw these different definitions, but the one thing that really stuck out for me, and I think Tash has really hit it for me, the key there is, is like the voluntary poverty bit. You know, that's where the passion, that's when you know if you're an avant-garde of something, you're prepared to go and not, go, not get those riches that your talent is a boy at, but you want to be you, you as an individual that leads the way, inspires and touch people's lives. And for me, and, it, and, it, and it, it, there's a thin line between villainy and, and bohemian lifestyle, right? because I think one is a bit too far than the other. So there needs to be a bit of intellect towards that as well. And I grew up, when I saw about all these definitions, it fit Brixton, that, and especially where I grew up, the front line of Brixton. And so there was all these different heroes that I saw around me from hustlers, and all of them are avant-garde in their own right, right? Whether it's the first skinhead, the first mod, first lovers rock but my hero for me is my mentor called a man called Devin Thomas now he was a, a family friend that goes back to my grandmother's days and he was a maroon which is um, something in Jamaica we're the free people of Jamaica we've got our own land we fought the war with the British we defeated them we was free and made this very proud culture and heritage of art and literature and oral and all these other things. And we brought that to us as in a community in Brixton. But we went undercover. That's what we're really famous for. Um, a camouflage. We're there, but we can't be seen. We're just getting on with it. He was on the edge. But he was also bright enough to leave behind the poverty and go and do his own thing. But he didn't. He stayed amongst us. And the beautiful thing about Devon, he had this place called the Black Archives, which is a little building right in the heart of Cold Arbor Lane. And it had a very, very simple mission. And that was to record and preserve and celebrate our culture and have our own place. And we used to go there every day like Brixton. If you went to Brixton back in the 81s and 80s, you'd go to Brixton, the market, you might go to the radiation, you'd meet different characters, different to what was really going on. On, 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 in, in our real world of poverty, fighting poverty, trying to survive, right? Being hungry and getting caught up in all the madness of it all. But Devin was different. He had this different calmness about him. And his mission about the shop was amazing because I was reading history I didn't even know about. I mean, I grew up in care for seven years, so I lost a part of my identity. And I found that I had an identity that was different. And I, I didn't have to conform to the imagery that people had of me. I can have my own image of myself and be who I want to be. And Devin showed me the way forward. But his task to go and get his own place was amazing. And it was like a 30-year battle. I mean, it was 30 years. And he had to influence and be an influencer to make it happen. And then finally, it went from the little shop. Then he went to a little archive sitting in Kenneth and then it all it was, he had no visitors, it was just a place filled with paperwork. It was like a mad professor's lab with things hanging all over the place and all these other bits. But if you ask him a question, Devon could find it. You say, Devon, I need something about black poetry in the 18th century. He'll just stretch over, pick it out, and he'll give it to you and he'll give you this mad uh, uh, dialogue about these people. You, you only ask one question, he'll have you there for hours. But it'd be worth it because I'm learning. He's feeding me something I wasn't really getting on road. And so finally, uh, him and, and a guy called Len Garrison, they was in it together as a little group. Len died, but 
and but the mission for the archives continued. And I was part of that second phase with Devon. I used to go around Brixton. He took me to new areas that I never thought were possible. He actually took me to a police station to meet the, the commander of the borough behind the desk and offered me coffee to a black man that's lived in Brixton. <laughs> this is unusual. This is avant-garde. I just looked at Deb and I said, you're the man. You are the man. And the inspector's giving me a cup of tea and things like that. And I was just sitting there going, what is happening here? And so, um, and then he, he did his, you know, he, he, he was part of Brixton Splash, the first big street party happening in Brixton that was really in a controlled environment that included all sorts of cultures and, and, and heritages and people. We used to gather every year with that project and for years. And then finally he got the Black Archives open and I was so chuffed for him. I, I, I could see his face and his pride. Of, he showed me right that, which is my now motto, do the work and the rest will follow. It's not about money. It's about heart, like, and Tash said, it's about passion. And if those things can inspire people and touch them, it's worth, I'm rich from that alone. And Devon was the richest man in Brixton, but he had no money in his pocket, in the convention, the way that we know it. And so I, so I love that about him. I said, so just do the work, and the, your community, you know that village, the village will feed you. It's so true. And if you're an advent God, and you're leading the way, and you're bringing change, your village will feed you. And Devon showed me that. But for me, when I said to him that the archives opened, all the other artists had to book up. I mean, talking about Benjamin Zephaniah, we're talking about Linton Quasi Johnson, they had to go through the proper route, not me. I just walked up to Devon, I said, Devon, can I have the mic today? He said, of course you can, Michael, just go and do your thing, right? And I went back to the motto of what the Black Archives was all about, which started by saying, we're here to record, preserve and celebrate the culture the event guards, the leaders. And I read a poem for the Black Archives that day. And I'm gonna close this bit with my dedication to Devon and his journey and his avant-garde spirit and the energy that he produced and his dream through the poem that I performed at the Black Archives. And it's just a simple poem and it goes, collect, preserve, celebrate. The doers, achievers, deliberates from the wind rush days to our present day as we collect preserve our history, bringing pride to my culture, heritage prolonged for books, documents and poetry and songs from the past that we value, want to pass on, collect, preserve, celebrate, man, woman, kings and queens, their rise, their fall, their visions, their dreams, cause heroes fall and heroes rise, today I wear their skin and heroes fall and heroes rise, it's their vision I am now standing in. And heroes fall and heroes rise, it's their story I love to sing. And heroes fall, heroes rise, it's their spirit I love to drink. Collect, preserve, celebrate. Collect, preserve, celebrate. So people can learn and gain from for my uh, gain new skills and behaviors and attitudes, a change will reveal that heritage and heritage and culture brings understanding. If interpreted, explained, identified, managed, bringing pride to my culture, heritage prolonged through places, events, experiences reported from the past that we value, want to pass on, collect, preserve, celebrate, man, woman kings and queens is their rise their fall their visions their dreams because heroes fall and heroes rise today i wear their skin and heroes fall heroes rise is their vision i am now standing in and heroes fall and heroes rise is their story i love to see because heroes fall and heroes rise is their spirit i love to drink and i will have to drink to devon's spirit today Thank you. Thank you. Oh my gosh, I love. Oh, <coughs> yes, yes, <laughs> uh, yes. I feel like energized for the day. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like, That's what the spirit is about. It's do you know what? And do you know what I think is really key about it? It's actually in in things that every single one of you have said um, this morning is that this is a history that we don't get taught. Right? It's a history yeah. that we don't get taught in schools in the conventional way, but actually I think it's a history that's 
far more inspiring and far mm -hmm. more engaging and that so many more people can connect with. We can't connect with kings and queens and royalty because... <laughs> 99.5% of us. We are kings and queens. We are. You know? We absolutely kings, are. We, in we our do own not underestimate under yourself. You are of the king course. and queen, you know, whatever. Of course. So. <laughs> but in that, in that conventional sense, so I think to, to hear the history of everyday people becoming kings and queens and doing things for their community, connecting as part of becoming a community and yes. just striving yes. to, to create. I think is so powerful. I'm going to say that we do have a couple of questions come in, so I'm going to ask them. Mm. Um, I think the first one we have is um, from David Simmons. Do you think the avant-garde feel has increased or decreased since that time? I'm actually going to open it up to everybody because I, I guess we all have an understanding of, of what that kind of question is. And do we think that the avant-garde feel has increased or decreased since, I guess, even the 1800s, but also a lot of you are referring to sort of like the 50s, 60s, uh, and 70s. Um, I want to pose it out to the panel. Just give me a wave and unmute yourselves. Go for it. Shall I start chronologically? Well, Thinking chronologically, um, comparing the, the early 19th century to now where we are, what, the early 21st century, um, I think, has the avant-garde feeling decreased or increased? I think it's it's always been there, right? The, there's that, that urge to um to 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 go with what makes you passionate and what you feel is is important rather than what is necessarily going to be uh the most financially stable option i mean henry Merger in in paris was was just about hanging it all together but he believed in his art and his writing <coughs> and, um and and that kind of lifestyle he had that bohemian temperament that michael <coughs> gray was talking about uh has has that feeling increased or decreased? Well, I don't, that's difficult to say, but I think having this term bohemian has given us a language to talk about it. And that's, mm. that's important because if we have the language, if we have the words, then we can have these kinds of conversations that we're having today and we can share our different perspectives and um, it gives us the tools for, uh, for, for thinking about the, the, um, the, the, this kind of temperament and, and desire and passion. Amazing. And um, Mike, I'm actually going to come to you with a slightly different question. I think it's going to, it's going to progress from that one. So Rima actually writes, hearing about the heritage of Bohemian has been interesting. Uh, the question is, is on the future. What does it look like in the future? Thinking of the trends going forward. So we have um, wellness, autonomous vehicles, media consumption, big tech companies taking over globally. <laughs> so what does Bohemian lifestyle mean in the context of this next 10 years? And how do we stay true to that nomadic, individualistic lifestyle? Go for it, Michael Gross. Second, Michael, go for it. Yes, that's an interesting question because I think that avant-garde has been taken over in the concept of innovation in technology. And mm. um, I feel that it, 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 it's a diversive thing because either you're, you, can either, you can either engage the technology and use it positively or you don't engage with it and then you could get left behind uh, technology and then your voice gets lost so i think that the event god is 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 there in technology but i hope it doesn't damage human endeavor that's going to say you know i i have to have all of it i don't need the latest ipad i don't need the latest phone i do need a phone and i do need an ipad but i need i don't need the latest one and i think that if we can have that mentality Rather, mm. which we was getting before, I have to have that phone. I have to have. That's not even God to have the latest phone. The, the phone is there to just communicate, not you know to, to be to, to, as a status quo. So I think it's still there. I think there's room for it if you can adjust. And I think I'll go back to Mary. If you've got a passion, right? then the, the technology and the speed of it won't hinder you because I think that energy and spirit will not make you knock down doors and be actually maybe bring a heart to the technology. I mean, I mean, I still use technology in, I, I use the portal for like dealing with and um, well-being elderly couples, elderly people that's isolated during the COVID, for example. So it would, could have been easy for me to just give them the, 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 um, the, um, the technology and just say, okay, off you go and they just browse. But we didn't we engage with them with learning to read, help them do their shopping, 
helping that tool become useful to their life mm. at the same time while they can still live their own passion. So yeah, for me, the future looks good for those with the avant-garde spirit and it's willing to like, you know, not be chased by the consumerism at all. And I think that you can have your, your innovation and, 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 and be impacting the society, what's going on with risk, they, whether it is they, they, they get sucked into society. Because when people get tired, they need somewhere else to go, right? They need somewhere to let off that to yourself, right, Tash? You've got that, that, yep. that, the woods around you, the quietness, of it, all the stillness, you know, that pulling away. You still need people that's willing to build these, these retreats, have these classes, have places like Michael said, the Savage Club, do these events, but you have your music. I think these places are so important. So when people need to have a, that passion, that spirit to say, yo, dude, if, whatever you want to be, you can be. No one's going to stop you. And I think that's so important. And I think, yeah, haven't God's got a future. Thank you so much. I'm going to have one final question. It's going to be a one word answer from each of you. Uh, the final question is, who are the modern day bohemians? Give us one name each. And then I want people to go away and Google it. I don't even want you to tell them who they are, what they do. Just literally, it's up to them to go and Google it. So modern day bohemians. <laughs> this might end up being our follow up in the follow up email that comes out. <laughs> I've got a name for you, Tim, Tim Atkins. Look him Tim, up. Look him up. Tim people. Atkins. Okay, number one, Tim Atkins. <laughs> Michael, Michael Collin, any, okay. anyone? I've got one. Marcus Moore. Marcus there Moore. You go. Okay, Marcus so you've Moore. got Tim Atkins, Marcus Moore. Any yeah. others? Uh, I'm going to give you Ishmael Blagrove the second. Ishmael Blagrove the second. I'm loving what? this. <laughs> I was, no, my, <laughs> my next question was going to be, what about Second. some women? That was literally yeah. my next question. What about some women? No pressure, Michael, but can you come up with a woman for us? <laughs> yes. I would actually say my mum, really. Nice. <laughs> she was, uh, Olive Morris. Olive I'd say Morris. Cherry Gross, go and look her up. Amazing. Olive Morris um, as well. I think Olive Morris is a fantastic, yeah. Pop up by you. Yeah. Thank you so much. So we have come to the end. We've gone a little bit oh, over. Wait a minute, wait a minute. One more. Oh, go for it. One more. Yeah, Lorna G. Amazing. Thank Lorna you. G. We will, we'll make sure that these uh, all these names come out in the follow-up email from David. Um, today, thank you so much for joining us. I, this has been a better history lesson than anything I ever got at school. I will say that right now. Thank you, a huge thank you to every single one of our panelists. Make sure you stay tuned for more of these uh, events coming up in the future. A huge also thank you to DICE, the DICE Charter, which are used, uh, it's, a, it's a charter that you can use to ensure that all your events are diverse, inclusive and accessible. Uh, you can check that out at dice.co.uk. Uh, um, but thank you to every single one of you. Enjoy the rest of your Tuesday. See you later.